the next piece is called The Movie That Wasn't There. I went to a movie and noticed that I was starring in it. I didn't remember shooting the movie, let alone auditioning for the part. I'm not an actor. Denouement. A harmless kung fu demonstration threaded into a hyperkinetic gore fest. I died, uttering tender, hopeful words into the ear of my wife. It was touching, despite the impossible carnage that distinguished the scene. People cried. Credits. Lights. We threaded out of the theater and went straight to the cemetery. A vast crane lowered me into a hole in the ground, closed casket. Ribbons of film dangled from the lid, encircling the casket and a corona of celluloid. The actress who played a hooker in the movie gave the eulogy. He was the only real man I knew, she whimpered, and made a sex motion with her finger. The audience <laughs> nodded in painful understanding. It was a long ceremony and hot out. Sweat trickled down my back. Countless grievers spoke on my behalf, explaining that, aside from egregious shortcomings, I was a good man. One woman didn't say anything. She stabbed herself repeatedly, at least 15 times, possibly more, blood spurting from the wounds, although I could tell that she made a calculated effort not to puncture any vital organs. An ambulance arrived almost immediately, and two paramedics put her on a stretcher and took her away. Fuck you, she shrieked. It may, I think, but maybe not, as the doors of the ambulance slammed shut. Nobody left until I had been buried. Only we. The director showed up at the last minute just in time to stomp the dirt into my grave. My wife accompanied him. She stood there quietly, staring at her toes. A grave digger passed out hors d'oeuvres on the silver platter of an overturned spade. <laughs> Chirping, soft breeze. Smell of fresh air and green pastures. Everybody clasped hands. We ran through a field of sunflowers, kicking up our knees. If we fell down, we lied there for a moment and observed the blue screen of sky. Insert solar eclipse. Denouement. The reel belied the projectionist's good intentions. It came loose and he didn't know how to fix it. White screen. I was blamed, and yet reviews of my actions were invariably positive. The only significant critique had to do with my physical stature, body of lies that didn't adequately reflect the courage of my character. Okay, just a couple more here. How are we doing for time? Oh. All the time. Uh, this is called The Storyteller. It, there's a little, uh, not subtitle, but uh, what do you call that? Thing beneath the title. In quotes, it says, based on a true story. And it is, in fact, based on a true story. There's this, let's see, how can I put this in a politically correct fashion? Now, there's a, a colleague of mine who uh, does things very like what happens in this story with the same sort of vigor and tenaciousness. Here we go. When he finished telling the story, he left my office. He came back, told me the same story, and left again. He came back again and told the story over, pausing to emphasize the importance of attention-grabbing introductions. He left. He came back a fourth time and told the story over twice, back to back. He left, came back. Halfway through the sixth elocution, I said, I think I've heard this story before. <laughs> he continued to the end as if there had been no interruption. He did a clumsy pirouette and reiterated the story. He left. He didn't come back. I looked at my computer, new email. He had sent me the story as doc, RTF, PDF, and WPS documents. He had also embedded it in the body of his email. I hope you enjoy this story, read the subject box. I deleted it. My phone rang. I answered it. I just sent you an email. In case you didn't receive it, I wanted to tell you something. He told me the story. He hung up and sprinted to my office. Hello, I said into the phone. Hello, hello. Hello, he said, standing in the doorway, and told me the story. I nodded. I made understanding faces. I smiled. I made surprised faces. I pushed out my lips. I nodded again. He finished the story, turned to leave, came back and told the story, turned to leave, came back and told the story, and told the story, and told the story, turned to leave, and left. I looked at my desk. A hole formed in my office wall. A drill bit leapt through the hole. Psst, he said, and then told me the story. Afterwards, he slipped two small rolls of paper through the hole that unfolded, revealed the story, one in shorthand, one in Sanskrit. I put a square of duct tape over the hole. I turned off my computer, I closed, and locked my office door. There was a knock at the door. I didn't say anything. There was another knock. 
I said, nobody's in here. He said, but the sound of your voice indicates a source, i.e. voices don't come from nowhere, or in this case, nobody. I agreed with him. <laughs> Open up, he reminded me. I unlocked and opened the door. He told me the story. <laughs> he was about to repeat the story when I said, yes, yes, it begins like this, then that happens, then it ends. Confused, he told me the story. <laughs> I fell asleep during the climax. He woke up and asked if I needed him to repeat the climax. <laughs> I can tell you what happens in the climax, I said, prompting him to repeat the climax. <laughs> then he backtracked and told the story from beginning to end. They shouted the words of the denouement. I put in a pair of earplugs. He slapped me across the face and the earplugs flew out. I stood defiantly. He implored me to calm down and take a seat. He apologized. He told me the story. <laughs> I told him my wife and daughter were expecting me at home. He told me the story. I told him I was hungry and wanted to go. He told me the story. He told me the story. I told him he had told me that very story 21 times today, not including written accounts, and not to mention how many times he had told me the story the day before and the day before and the day before. He replied, at the end of time, in the anus of entropy, when the universe burns out and all of the stars turn into black holes, the only thing left will be my story. <laughs> I told him I disagree. Other people told stories too. I wondered how his story might stay alive in the wake of human oblivion. He said it was my right to disagree. He said it was human nature to wonder about things. Then he said, now listen to this, and told the story, and told it again, and again, and again, over and over, and over again. Eventually, he grew tired. His neck gave, and his head tipped to one side, to the other side. His shoulders slouched. His voice cracked and got raspy. He fought the urge to fall to his knees. On his knees, he fought the urge to fall to his stomach. On his stomach, he whispered the story with resolve at first, but his voice gradually petered out as his eyelids weakened, flickered, and closed. He continued to mouth the story in silence for a few minutes before slipping into a deep catatonic sleep, at which point the story may or may not have played out in his dreams, rerun after rerun, like a doorbell that goes on forever, like a curtain that perpetually rises and falls, daring its audience to set it on fire, put it out of its misery. Before leaving, I called my wife and told her about my day. She kept telling me this story, I said. And in the calmest voice she could muster, she replied, I know that story, darling. We're waiting for you. <laughs> Last one's really short. It's called To Bed, To Bed, Good Night. I marched into the kitchen and dropped my suitcase onto the floor. Dirty socks and frayed underwear sprung onto the appliances. I'm home, I announced. Where have you been? asked my mother, blowing steam from a cup of coffee. Everywhere. I'm a world traveler. I've seen everything and met everybody. A snake tried to bite me once. A cobra. I outran it. Now I'm back. Where are you going? asked my father, blowing steam from a cup of lentil soup. To bed, to bed. Good night. Good night, said my parents as steam swallowed their heads and melted the cone of their throats. <laughs>